The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Receiving several emails, and when the emails of people who are being ministered to by this ministry, whether it's in the school or uh, they're viewing us or you're here present, we've had some of the same kinds of emails. So I, you can learn something from those, can't you? And one of them was basically saying, here's someone who's telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. So the, um, one of the missing links is application. How do I do what I already know the Bible says I need to do? And here's one that we just got uh, yesterday, but it's typical is the reason I'm reading this. Um, this person wrote, encloses an offering in deep appreciation for teaching me how to practice God's presence. About 18 years ago, I read the book, Practicing His Presence, that had letters written by Brother Lawrence. Many of you are familiar with that. And I tried and tried and tried, which produced the fruit of discouragement. <laughs> Might as well eat worms. <laughs> and he said, God doesn't love me syndrome. Have you ever been there? <laughs> then I learned from you all to yield, yield, yield. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Each and every one of you that's been equipped in this ministry for even a very short period of time, have the capacity to help a new believer or an experienced mature believer. Because many of these emails are coming across the board. I believe if they're a new believer, what they're learning is gonna save them a lot of unnecessary misery. You agree? And some of those that we've gotten emails from been in the faith for 40 years. And they said, here's someone telling us how to do what I already knew we were supposed to do. So for a new believer, we want to encourage you that even, even what I'm going to begin sharing today, as a new believer, this could save you a lot of aggravation. Uh, hopefully, I'll include all my mistakes. So learn from my mistakes, because that's the way we learn sometimes, right? But if you could skip some of those mistakes and just draw closer to God, you'll be the better for it. So in this session... It's going to be the role that emotions play in spiritual maturity. What role do emotions play in spiritual maturity? If you're a new believer, listen up, because this will save you a lot of aggravation. You cannot be more spiritual than your emotions allow. Those emotions need to be brought under the Lordship of Jesus, and we can teach you how. So newer used <laughs> Christian, there's an opportunity for you to bring an acceleration of maturity in your life. Obviously, you know there's no such thing as instant maturity, but you can bring an acceleration in that development. They've learned, even secularly, that EQ is more important than IQ. Did you know that? Some of your people, when they hire an Ivy League graduate, they're looking for, not just for their accomplishment, mentally, but they're looking, how are they emotionally? Are they stable? Do they have a drug problem? Do they, are, do they drink too much? You know, they want to see where are you emotionally? Do you beat your wife? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Those things are important because basically emotional quotient or your EQ really is more important than your IQ. And more importantly than your EQ and your IQ is your spiritual quotient for a believer but the spiritual quotient cannot exceed what the emotions allow. And we found that even in, uh, in the secular realm, as of the 90s, they've, they found a radical discovery that emotions, they call it emocognition, emovolition. Your emotions control your thinking and your emotions control your choices. So even when you think you don't have any, Oh, yes, you do. You have desires. You have preferences. You have wants. You have needs. And there's things you go after. That is still emotionally inspired. And even if you override your emotion, 
mind, will, and emotions, if it's not under the lordship of Jesus, they're like three bad kids. Whichever one's leading, the other two go along with it. And we want to teach people how to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. So the two essential ingredients, and I know people that have studied our material know this. If in doubt to any question that I would ask in any of the modules, this is good for a new believer. If you memorize this, you'll look like you really know what's going on. The two answers are forgiveness and peace. If you don't know the answer, pick one of those, and you're likely to be right. <laughs> Did you know that uh, the CDC says 90% of physical ailments are emotionally based? How much better health would we have if we really brought, learned to bring those emotions under? And it's the least taught subject, I believe, in the church. And what, what, what we've done is we've, even our children, take them to a Christian school, and primarily the emphasis is going to be we're going to teach them how to think, we're going to teach them how to act, and we're going to teach them how to speak. But if they have emotional problems, then what? Well, the good news is now, and until now, we can teach them how to deal with the emotions. Revelation for a believer should rule over the thought processes. Revelation that comes to your spirit should rule over your thought processes. The will needs to be yielded to your conscience. The conscience should rule the will. You know, red light, green light, yellow light in there, that means don't override that. <laughs> that means obey promptly and sharpen that conscience. The third element, of course, is that the emotions would be allowed to commune with God. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, but the spiritual man discerns all things. In other words, in your, just your mind, will, and emotions, or an unsaved individual, they cannot discern. Matter of fact, most of your spiritual talk will appear to be foolishness to them because it's spiritually discerned. That means you have equipment within you have an anointing that abides within, and God wants to have you learn to allow it to teach your head, right? Now, the subjects that we said that we would be repeating, because I believe that we're to make ready a people prepared for a huge harvest, and that means that the pastors and the leaders cannot be the total source of grace. So our passion is to equip believers to be able to help a new believer and get them over those initial uh, difficulty, especially with the emotions. Uh, the mind, will, and emotions, God made us that way. A thinking, feeling, choosing being, right? We can do all of those. We can think, we can feel, and we can make choices. But we need those to be under the lordship of Jesus. So how, how do we do that? Well, first of all, what we've begun to do is recommend that communion, when it rules the emotions, it's really... This is good for the men who don't feel like they have them. Well, they don't have many. They usually, it's like the, we used to call it the Crayola box. Women have the 64 flavors of emotion. <laughs> Nuances that no one else ever heard of. And then you have men, and they got this one Crayola, highly used, and it incorporates all nuances into one Crayola. It's called frustration. That could mean anything. Frustration, or better yet, because even frustration, somehow, if you want to sound manly, you say stressed, like it's a virtue. Oh, we used to travel in New England. You know, New England has this work ethic that they were very proud of. So you ask somebody, how are you doing? They go, oh, 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 stress, frazzle. So we know that you're a hard worker. Right? Isn't that the implication? But in the kingdom of God, that's not true. The kingdom of God is when you are allowing that Prince of Peace to rule in your spirit, you are both resting and ruling at the same time. You are basically overcoming people and circumstances with the presence of God who is greater that is in you than that which is in the world, no matter what's out there no matter what's coming against you. Wouldn't you like to learn how to stay that way more completely and more fully? Okay, baby Christians, you need this one. 
the analysis of the emotion <clears throat> is basically in two categories. If you're a new believer, then you're going to fall in one of these two categories. One, the emotional inclination. One that's extremely excitable. When you first got saved, come on, you were extremely excitable, right? Well, you know what? That's to be expected. That's part of God's training. And the weakness is you can have a tendency in that excitement, and I'm talking about spiritual excitement to where God really does something, and boy, you get the goosebumps, and, and you're just on cloud nine. And you know, like in my culture, it was the drug culture. We used to use the term high on Jesus. Because we found out here's the first time that we had a sensation of freedom and liberty that was not drug-induced, but there was no crash to it. In other words, it could be maintained. However, the weakness to that is you can then be deceived by carnal emotions. The carnal emotions can start to dictate to you rather than learning how to be, receive the dictates of the Spirit of God within. How to let the Spirit of God rule. Because those feelings were legitimately God. They excited you. And the weakness would also be and this is good for new believers as well as those that have been around for quite a while. You have a tendency to be motivated to seek those highs. Hmm? Jennifer laughs at all my examples. I remember the first time when I had a whole line of people and I was praying for them and they fell down in the spirit. And you felt that you felt that release and you knew that it was God doing it. That they, I could tell the difference between somebody that throws himself down, someone who gives you a courtesy fall, and someone who <laughs> yields to the Spirit because they're God hungry. There is a difference. You can't go by the outward action. You've got to go by the discern the motive. All right? You can do it right. You can do it wrong. You can do a lot of things right. You can do a lot of things wrong. But the problem was I knew there was an anointing that just came supernaturally. I knew that I gave God credit for fixing my mouth to talk. I was aware that it was better than I could do without him, <laughs> clearly. But I stayed awake all night in bed, picturing those people going, boom, whoop. I, then I'd resurrect them, have them stand back up, knock them back down. And I found out that what I thought was anointing was really an adrenaline. Because you said, oh, but it had so much life, I stayed up all night. That's not life. That's not the Zoe God kind of life. That's an adrenaline rush and it's an emotional high. And you've got to learn to make those distinctions in your spiritual life. So that could be a weakness for new and used believers. They've learned to experience the emotional highs, which are genuinely spirit, but they've gotten to the point where they depend on them. And then it's the second lesson. We'll get into this someday. But the first six months I was saved, I would say there was relatively no feelings, per se, except an inner assurance that this is the way we were meant to live. That's a good concept, right? This was the way God created us to live. This is the proper way to live, six months. Then the stuff started happening. Then open vision with my eyes wide open, a joy and a flooding uh, speaking in another language. And I looked at this body and my first revelation was, we need a new body because the joy was at a point that it was so strong, I thought my body was going to explode. And it went for three months without a reprieve. Then, one day, just like that, it stopped dead. Young people, mature people, there's a lesson in here to learn. And I went, and I, you, will, you could fall into the devil's trap of thinking you sinned some great sin. You could fall in the devil's trap that God left me. Hmm? When all in all, he does it to almost everyone for a reason. He wants to train you for reigning. He wants to uh, 
train you to not live by them, understand them, and even recognize how you can negotiate or, uh, you know, really just negotiate the curves, the ups and downs in life in a proper way that brings forth the best fruit. Now, I went to a meeting and I was already filled with the Holy Spirit, but I was so troubled by this lack of this joy. Where did it go? What did I do? How do I get it back? Until, uh, I think it was Ralph Wilkerson from Melody Land, maybe some of you have ever heard of him. And he was visiting a, a church that I was uh, attending. And he wanted people to go in the back room. There was 80 people in the back room to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I wanted answers, and I didn't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so I thought I'd be humble. And I'd say, Lord, let me be last, because these other people need that. But I've got to talk to somebody about what's happening. And so sure enough, guess what? Out of 80 people, I was number 80. And he walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder, and began to laugh. And said, let me tell you a story, young man. He says, this is before I got a chance to say anything. He said, when I was a young man, he says, I had experienced supernatural joy that was truly joy unspeakable and full of glory. And he says, and when it left, this is where I got convicted. He said, when it left, the Lord asked me, do you love me more than the joy? I waited in that meeting to be the 80th person to feel like a creep. I don't want anyone to feel like a creep. Make this decision in your heart now. Do you love me more than the feeling? I'd have been a candidate to be suckered by that because I came out of the drug culture. They were looking for that feeling. And I said, Lord, if I... And kind of like what a heavy, Lord, if I never feel <laughs> your joy again, <laughs> I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And from that day forward, it came back at a, at a constant flow, or what we would call practicing the presence of the Lord. It, uh, there was the ups and downs of the training, but I'm saying you could save yourself so much aggravation if you really understood the emotions. We have it in our children's books, even, that we've taught them how to think and we've taught them how to act, but until now, we've not taught them what to do with their emotions. And if the emotions are ruling your thinking and the emotions are ruling your choices, we better learn how to bring, how to deny their rule. You agree? Yeah. And let the rule of God. So, the two categories of an emotional temperament is the emotional one like I was. Blah, everything, sky's falling. One minute you're in ecstasy and the next minute, oh, what happened? God left, all right? Nobody can identify with this, right? All right, but there's lessons to be learned in this to save us a lot. Um, seeking the experience for spiritual high then can be, can be a motivation. Now, all of a sudden I've gotta have that. I've gotta have that high and you set about looking for that high. And you can quite frankly be run by your emotions and not be really running by what God has for you. You could be in the wrong place at the wrong time all the time looking for that high. Now, there's the second type of believer. And actually, I think Jennifer said that uh, you were more the second type. She did not have radical spiritual experience like I did. I had radical spiritual experience to such a degree that I didn't know who to talk to because most of the people did not. I can remember going to a Christian businessman's lunch and the young people my age that were there weren't really interested in Jesus. They were there to see if they could get a job from a Christian businessman. And so then, of course, then they fell into the next problem, pride, spiritual pride. Well, thank God I'm not like that. Could that happen? There's a, it flip-flops. It flip-flops between insecurity that you can't relate to somebody, but it also can bring about the pride of superiority, like, thank God I've got a handle on some of this stuff. Come on, young people, I want to save you. I want to save you from learning this stuff the hard way. All right, so I'm going to tell on myself, and hopefully you learn from it and go, I don't want to do that. 
Huh? I knew brothers and sisters that grew up by watching their older brother or sister get spankings all the time and going, I don't think I'm going to do that when I get older. That's, that's wisdom, right? No. The second one is the analytical inclination. The weakness for that is they may be genuinely saved, but their weakness is they are more susceptible to fear, doubt, and unbelief. The analytical inclination, they have a tendency to allow genuine spiritual experiences to be dismissed. You know what Jennifer and I do to help a new believer with that? When I have them uh, say they pray in the Spirit for the first time, and they get that beautiful prayer language, when I discern an anointing on it, I will tell them, I can feel an anointing on that. I can discern an anointing. That helps the analytical type not talk themselves out of it later. It's very beneficial. No one ever died for too much encouragement either. I haven't seen one yet. It's not fatal. It could actually help somebody. But the mental people have a tendency to lean a little too hard towards suspicion of anything that's dramatic. Well, I'm not going to apologize. I had dramatic spiritual experience. So that puts us in a place where if you're analytical and did not have rich spiritual experience, the tendency would be to dismiss everyone who did, wouldn't it? Just as I was, in my arrogance, dismissing everyone that didn't. <laughs> Let's learn from these things. <laughs> Correct? You know, those emotions can get you in trouble. Because hmm? you could be looking for something other than God. What we all need to do, and before this, this time, this session is over, really, what we need to do is basically say, you know, God, I want you more than any feeling, more than any manifestation, I want you. And I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. That's healthy for us at, at any, walk, any place in your spiritual walk. Young man, child, father, wherever you're at, we need that. Now, this analytical... Uh, you can be proud of what you think you know. These are the things that I've watched even amongst my peers as we grew in the things of God. The analytical ones get proud in their biblical knowledge. And they're always learning and learning. But you know what? So were the Pharisees, weren't they? And what did Jesus say? You search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They, they point to me and you won't come to me. The analytical will prefer information over intimacy and even hide behind it in insecurity. Is there something wrong with gaining more and more understanding? No. But the real understanding that matters is first the wisdom that goes to your spirit. True wisdom only goes to the spirit. All other wisdom is either sensual or demonic. Wisdom has to go to the spirit then informs your mind. Now, there's two categories of spiritual inclinations. Are you ready? Now we know there's the thinkers and there's the emoters. There's the drama people, <laughs> the excitable ones, and then there's the ones that are going to figure it out. You know what would save a young believer a lot of misery? Trust instead of figure it out. Boy, would it save you the problems. You can't trust and be stressed at the same time. That's a physiological and spiritual impossibility. You can't trust God and be stressed at the same time. If we could teach believers the role of the emotions, you would begin to die to that striving and enter into a rest that is a flow. To walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with Him and with one another, and the blood cleanses us. It's a river. It's a flow. But to engage in that flow, you have to have mind, will, and emotions properly denied its rule. One of the most difficult things to even teach believers, and we have it in our simple prayer, what God took me through in the school of the Spirit, I wouldn't trade for any piece of information that's out there right now. 
What he taught me in those first six months was, Dennis, close your eyes, and when you touch me, not in heaven, point number one, when you touch my spirit in there, you honor me. That's before you get a word, before you get a feeling, before you get a, any kind of a revelation, before you did anything, you cultivate in your spirit to honor me by merely closing your eyes and coming to me. You don't evaluate whether it's dry, whether it's thrilling. You simply realize that honor is the first issue. And you honor him by going to him first. If you could learn that, you'd be surprised. Because then all of a sudden, you begin to recognize all activity is, does this honor God or is this, look, is this something for self? Is this something glorifying God or is this something for self? And it, it helps. Like I said, there's no instant maturity, but there certainly can be an acceleration. That's what I want to see the people at Kingdom Life and throughout the body enter into an acceleration of maturity. Get over those emotional bumps. Learn from it. The two categories of spiritual inclination is those who have rich spiritual experience, like I did. Jennifer didn't have that, so she's on the other spiritual experience. And I can see the, the pros and cons with both of us, because my weakness would have been seeking goosebumps, overlook the importance of peace as a ruling influence. That's, that would be the people who are looking for the thrill. You override looking for the peace of God, which means Jesus is ruling. Oh, so then the feelings or the experience is more important than Jesus? Let's pray that right now. Father, your joy, and I'm talking legitimate God emotions. I'm talking the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, as evidenced in feeling, is not more important than you. And I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. I receive forgiveness if I've exalted feeling. I don't care how much life something has on it. It is not more important than him. Can you go with that? All right. Now, you can overvalue or place too high of a value on the dramatic. Hmm? Is that possible? Now, uh, we're going to get into this later on in a series as to how the enemy can use that as well. If he can tap into you on that. You can actually devalue, and this was my number one lesson that the God taught me in the school of the spirit, because I was an emotional person. Still am. But God basically showed me how to use them properly, how to get them under the Lordship, how to deny its rule and learn from them. Let them be your friends. We teach this in, in the modules, don't we? Let your negative emotions be your friends. And people go, what? Your negative emotions are telling you something. Jesus isn't ruling right now. That'd be a good way to learn, wouldn't it? When you're angry, hurt, Fear, lustful, guilty, ashamed. Jesus isn't ruling right now. That would be one of the most important lessons you could learn to save yourself a lot of aggravation. But I devalued at times until God took me to the school of the Spirit. I devalued the subtle. Didn't He do this with Elijah? The man of power? What did he have to do to balance him out even? It's not in the earthquake, it's not in the fire, it's not in the wind, it's in the still small voice. And I'm saying the people who are, are too prone to the high level experience miss the subtleties that could have been theirs. The still small voice. Most supernatural, and I'm saying most, most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. So you know what the Lord took me after honoring him? And you know, when he taught me to honor him, and you can all do this at whatever stage in your Christian life you're at, 
He says, first of all, Dennis, I'm a person. Honor my personhood. I don't look at the Holy Spirit as an it. But the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the love of the Father, they dwell in me. And it's that I honor his mind, his will, and his emotions. Isn't that simple? I want his mind, I want his will, and I want his emotion. And secondly, here's what I don't want to do. It's the negative side. I don't want to grieve, quench, or resist you in that relationship. You think that would promote intimacy? I am surrendering my will, my mind, and my emotions. I want your mind in the matter. Of course, all of this is going to come from your knower. Up. I want how you feel. I want how you think. I want how you will. Your will be my will. And in that context of that, God would say, he, the one scripture that I, we even use in, in training people with this to sit still, especially high strung emotional people who are really love God, but you're going to be shipwrecked if you don't get it under control and bring yourself a lot of unnecessary pain. We teach them basically like a weaned child with its mother. I have quieted my soul within me. What the Lord showed me is when you, that mind, will, and emotions are like three noisy kids. When I used to, I'm hyperactive, and when I would sit down to pray, the first thing I want to do is get up and walk and pray, which may or may not be bad, but do you follow me? God showed me just how antsy my flesh is. Not that that was bad, but just showed me that until you can quiet that mind, will, and emotions, which really brings us subordinate. It really brings it under the rule. It says, you haven't really met me until you've quieted your flesh. Like a weaned child with its mother, I have quieted my soul, my mind, will, and emotions within me. That is the beginning of the relationship. So you miss a great deal. The people with the emotional inclination miss a lot of supernatural because of the inability to apply the work of the cross, really, on your mind, will, and emotions. Does that make sense? All right. Now, those who have had subtle spiritual experiences have a different kind of problem. They talk themselves out of the reality of what happened. <laughs> and benefit a great deal with a dual witness. And that's what I shared before. That's what we do, don't we? We go, there, that's it. How did I train Jennifer, who was very cerebral, did not, hungered and thirsted for God, but everything was so difficult? Just like the email we got this morning, right? I've been trying and trying and trying. And Red Brother Lawrence and I tried and I tried and tried. And I might as well eat worms. <laughs> All right. There's a lot of people like that. Because all they're doing differently is they're trying instead of yield, yield, yield. Surrender, surrender, surrender needs to be brought back into the believer's vocabulary. Surrender is a good thing. Yielding is a good thing. Uh, Derek Prince had a, had a pamphlet one time, The Grace of Yielding. If we would only pay attention to those things. Instead of try, 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 how about yield, yield, yield? Right? The advantage that people have had subtle experiences they can develop an easier awareness of when peace is missing. I could go anywhere in the world, saved or unsaved person, and say, can you tell? These are, this is for the benefit of people say, I don't feel, which is a physiological impossibility, but all right. But supposing you're one of those people that say that. Uh, I can go anywhere in the world and ask a person, do you know, are you aware when you're relaxed and when you're stressed? And I've never found anybody that couldn't make that distinction. Start there if need be. And you could save yourself heartache. Learn that stress means you have just started to play God 
and do in your own strength what really God would have liked to do through you. We say the one verse of scripture that we would ask for in our modules even would be first the two questions. What do you do? And they say forgive or peace. And they'll be right most of the time. The third one is Philippians 2.13. You want to be a successful believer? You want to walk in the anointing? Then you're going to have to learn experientially Philippians 2.13. Not quote it. We're better at quoting it than living it. Living Philippians 2.13 is, For it is God who is at work in me, not in heaven, in me, to will and to do. Well, if God's in you to both will and to perform, what is your part? Yield. And when, how do you know if you're yielded? Peace. Come on. It's either forgiveness or peace. It's the only way to stay in union and communion with God and walk in the light as He is in the light. Right? All right. We have those two. And, and basically the ad, uh, analytical inclination type people, I notice one of the things that they struggle with is basically they're afraid of a false experience. Huh? Believe that? Afraid of a false experience. How do I know that's God? Do you know if you would stay more in tune with your spirit, your spirit would know truth from error, right from wrong. And you wouldn't figure it out in your mind whether it's a true or false experience. That's the mental inclination. They're afraid of false experience. But that fear could be overrided to the point where the spiritual man discerns all things. You make a distinction. I've seen actions that outwardly were identical, but inwardly had a different motive. You have that capacity. You have an anointing. And the Holy Spirit in you wants to teach you that difference if you're willing to learn. So, what I did with Jennifer was basically said, when she would drop down to her spirit and get out of her head, I would feel the anxiety. I could just bear witness. And I'd say, there, that's it. A lot of the low experience people need that kind of corroboration, but once you give them that corroboration, they can run with it. We've taught it to little children. Once they have, oh, that's my knower down here, not this knower, that's my knower down, oh, that's it. They don't need you anymore. They can evaluate from that time on those things that are subtle. But Jennifer ran with it instantly, and she progressed in a, in a period of 60 days. Less than 60, really, but we call it the 60-day challenge, named after Jennifer. She went from a cerebral Christian to an extremely sensitive Christian. We would be praying, and I would discern nuance in the spirit, and I'd say, Jennifer, what do you feel in the Spirit? I wanted the flavor of the Spirit. You know, you read your Bible, there's a haughty spirit, there's a humble spirit. There's a flavor. It's not just God or the devil. All right? And, and she had a track record, I think, in the 90 percentile right from the beginning. Once she learned how to locate, and I said, there, that's it. She would say, uh, and I would write down, and I would never tell her what I got. I'd write down, there, right now, there's a presence of joy. I'd write down joy, and she'd say, uh, an effervescence. You know, it wouldn't be the exact word, but the nuance in the atmosphere, and that's just two of us praying together in a room alone. You practice by reason of use, you get acclimated. But now, if she was cerebral, she could very easily go up to her head and go, I don't know, I don't feel nothing. Whenever someone says, I don't feel nothing, I know where they're at. They're in their head. But what we're saying is they need to be taught how to sink into his presence to be closed so that he can guard your heart and your mind. But when I said, there, that's it, Jennifer ran with it from that time on. And from that time on, I would ask her every morning, and we did this for years, we still do it, but we did it uh, in, in those early years, Jennifer, what do you sense? And then I would take it a step further. If you're getting a nuance, it's a person, isn't it? It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. It's my Messiah. If I would feel a nuance, then I would say, based on that nature, either give me a name of God, 
Because you know the names of God reveal what? Aspects of his character and his nature. Give me a name of God or a scripture that matches what you're discerning. I'll tell you what, it was education. It was Holy Spirit 101. To the point that later in life you can navigate redemptively to help people because you can feel what nuance is coming from them, good or bad. <laughs> like that person smiling, I feel anger coming from them. Why can I feel anger? How can I discern someone else's anger? Because I'm at peace. Peace precedes perception. Love precedes the peace, and love is peace. Peace resting and ruling. But it's also, it's also a window into the spirit realm to where the spiritual person discerns all things. Now, emotions can be troublemakers. We're not denying that. Or I think the carnal emotion are problematic. Uh, we always said, make them your friends. Let them be like big bird coming in with a sign, even if you're a little child and saying, Jesus isn't ruling right now while you're angry. And it's not hard to catch on after a while that what he did to me in the school of the Spirit, and we repeat this in almost every message because it's so significant to keep you in the Lordship of Jesus. And that was, Dennis, when I would get upset, frustrated, <laughs> he would say, Dennis, don't let something come between what you and I have together. So how did I interpret what you and I have together? He was saying that feeling was coming between us. And you know what you learn then? You learn not just to walk in forgiveness, but you learn to deal with temptation to where you don't even have to forgive because you've gotten so quick at going, ah, I, it's not worth it. Let it go. But when you let it go, you let it go from the will, from your heart. And if you buy into it for a little while, then you need to release forgiveness. I learned quick, prompt obedience is beneficial. But we teach them how to think, we teach them how to talk, we teach them how to act, but until now, we've not taught them what to do with their emotions. But we're doing it now. Emotions are powerful. Emo cognition, emo volition. The emotions control the thoughts, the emotions control the choices. It's probably still one of the least taught subjects. Their whole life appears to revolve largely around the impulse of religion, emotional Christians. And I'm very pro discerning your emotion, but making sure that they get under the Lordship. All right? I'm going to give you three aspects of emotion. If you're a note taker, write these three down. This is the function of emotion. Our emotional life is both uh, comprehensive and complicated. <laughs> But the first one is actually what we would call the fruit of the Spirit, and Jennifer and I have kind of uh, labeled it the God emotions, simply to show you that in the garden, before sin entered, they walked in communion with God. Their emotions only knew communion. So the fruit of the Spirit was the the emotions that God made you a thinking, feeling, choosing being. Why did He make give you those feelings? Was for the fruit of the Spirit to be experienced and His rule to be flowing like conduits through that emotional system. Now, the fruit of the Spirit would be the first function of the emotions was that the fruit of the Spirit would flow during those channels. Let the peace of God rule, Colossians 3.15. I love this one because I learned this one experientially. I felt that when God took me to the school of the Spirit, He would bombard me with His affection. And then I saw the Apostle Paul say, how I long for you all with the affection of Jesus. So I'm going, if He longs for us all with the affection of Jesus, He had to receive it or He couldn't give it. He wasn't giving us something he never got. So I would bask and just say, I don't really need this from people. I need this from him. He's the source. 
and I would just bask in my prayer time sometimes for just a couple of minutes at a time and just, and just bask in receiving that affection that I might be able to give it, as Paul said, how I long for you all with the affection. That's good emotion, isn't it? That's Holy Spirit emotion. You need emotions to do that. I can't picture Paul going, I long, I long for you all uh, my affection because the word says so. By faith. I believe he was engaged, mind, will, and emotions. And the flow of the Spirit had anointing on it. But he also knew whether he abounded or abased in situations, circumstances, and I believe your emotional makeup, you remained constant in him. Now, I always liked the two. The love of God controls me. Do you know people are always running and we're always ministering to people who have control issues or someone has a control issue and somebody's controlling me. If you really understood lordship and the love of God constraineth you, controls you, presses you on all sides, eliminating any other option. That's focus, right? Pressing me on all sides, eliminating. There's only one option and that's to love. All right? Nobody can control you. We in the flesh think, I have to fight back, I've got to run away, or I'm going to lay down and be a doormat. That's, I'm not a, those are not appealing. Laying down and being a doormat and let people walk all over you, that's not, the, that's not the love of God. Fighting back when they try to push you, that's not the love of God. Running away, isolating yourself, that's not the love of God. Well, what's the fourth alternative? Well, the Lord showed me, Dennis, if I can teach you to stay and maintain my lordship through peace in a hostile environment, and I practice, because this didn't come overnight, I practiced in a hostile environment. Start with a minor hostile environment like church. Before you go out, before you go out in the real world where it's really hostile, start out where it's easy, church. And, and when you run across a hostile Christian, you drop down to your spirit and you maintain that peace and it will guard your heart and your mind. And it really, really works. And you know what Jesus showed me? He took me to that scripture where they went to push him off a cliff. And he walked through the crowd. He didn't fight. He didn't run away. He didn't lay down and let him walk all over him either, did he? That should be a lesson for all of us. You want to have the, the reigning power of Jesus, your Messiah, in you, then you need to learn that you have a fourth option. You don't have to fight, you don't have to run away, and you don't have to lay down. But you can maintain your peace and let the pieces fall where they will, and you, nobody can control someone who's under control. It's impossible. Even Eleanor Roosevelt almost had that idea. She said, nobody can make you feel bad about yourself unless you let them. <laughs> there's, a, there's a partial truth in there, isn't it? You're in good shape unless you let somebody. Now, the second area. Now, back to the God emotions. Before we get to the second, as good as they are, what did we say was the downside of it? That you could love the feeling more than God. Even though it's legitimate fruit of the Spirit, you love Him more than that. I'm telling you what, I, I married a tiger. I tell that story all the time, too. But you know, at my age, I'm gonna, you're going to hear a lot of the stories over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, being physically worn out, commuting 70 miles one way to work, 140 a day, left that night, went night. And after doing that for several years, she said, how many of you resolve your problems like this? I'm going down to Pensacola to a prophetic presbytery and I'm going to have prophets of God pray for me because I don't think I can maintain this pace. That's a woman of God. Huh? She, didn't do this, she didn't do the six C's. And they went down there and they said, Jennifer, you can have whatever you want, one of the prophets said. 
And Jennifer instantly went to, oh, a little house with a white picket fence, no pressure in my life. <laughs> Just what we would all do, right? No pressure in my life, everything goes smooth, a little white picket fence, you know. And then she, the real Jennifer rose up. And she went, no. If this, is, this suffering and this pain is the best that you have for me, God, then so be it. That's the kind of woman I married. Whoa. Uh, you know, you can write a book about a tiger, but the better way is let them out of the cage. They'll prove themselves. Well, basically, she was put in a corner, but she let the Jesus, the Messiah, rise up and roar like the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's what roared on the inside of her. And I'll tell you what, she wouldn't be, she wouldn't be where she is today, healthy, spiritually healthy, physically healthy, if it weren't for those kind of attitudes. So I don't love the joy more than I love God. I'm not a feeling addict, but I love his presence. You have to know the difference. The second type of emotion are called desires. Now, in this church, we've saved a lot of people aggravation by calling them lusts, appetites, and agendas. An agenda ultimately is you're living in idolatry. And an agenda can be something that's not sin in and of itself. Do you know the excuses they made at the wedding feast when Jesus invited people to feast? Write this down, note takers. Mm -hmm. When they were invited, the excuses were what we would call legitimate. A relationship. Oh, I just married and I need to spend time with my wife. I just bought some property. Hmm? Relationship, property, business, possessions, business, all of those, there's nothing wrong with them. Don't we teach people to have good relationships? We teach people to work and have a good work ethic. We teach people, use what you've got, establish a business, grow, multiply. But you can pursue them above God as an excuse. How many times have you used a legitimate thing? Well, I want to have, uh, I can't go to church today, I've got to have a party. Uh, I can't do this, da da. Those are really subtle things. That's not legalism. I'm talking about you evaluate, you can do that with a proper heart attitude, you can do it with a wrong heart attitude, couldn't you? Relationships, property, and business. When is it more important than Jesus? Because in reality, the lesson is stewardship, not ownership. Stewardship basically means they are gods. Last week I told you about my 1979 Dodge Colt. And he did that with all material possessions from that day forward. But it was the most unusual, it was my first new car, my first non-junk, 1979 Dodge didn't want to get any scratches on it, didn't want it to get dirty, didn't want it to get rained on. <laughs> and God said, that's my car. Did you not give me everything? And I went, and I released it. And now this is a true spiritual experience, but I can equate it with an experience that you are well aware of. Do you, are you aware of the feeling you have when you drive someone else's car? spiritualize that, that's what it felt like. From that point on, it was never mine. It was God's car. Makes you a good steward of your property, too, in the meantime. <clears throat> so, lusts, appetites, agendas versus God's desires. How many people over the years, we could have saved them a lot of pain, but they said, well, God's going to give you the desires of your heart, and so... And really, they were lusting after what they wanted. They didn't know the difference between likes and dislikes and God's desires and their carnal desires. Because it was not a sinful thing, they automatically assumed God wanted it. I watched that, and I've seen that for years. I'm praying that the day's coming where people are going to have ears to hear what the Spirit says. Find out what God's desires are. When your desires are His desires, it's because you're yielded to Him. 
Then he gives you the desires of your heart because they match his. And do you really want something you don't want? Didn't we talk about that last week when they got the, when, <laughs> while the quail was still within their teeth? They died. Do you know what they named that place? The Graves of Craving. Makes me want to not crave anything other than God. All right? Well, it might give you what you want and send leanness into your soul. Now, I don't want to scare you with that message. You need to go back and listen to the six deadly seas, and they were deadly, literally. <clears throat> Feelings is the third element. So you have genuine fruit of the Spirit that impact your emotions. Those are good, unless you love them more than God. Secondly, desires, appetites, and agendas. You need to ask God to really search your heart and bear witness, is this agenda an idol? Even if it's in and of itself it's a good thing. Is it overriding my devotion to Jesus? That's a good test. In other words, another way to test it too is drop down into your spirit, close your eyes, and offer it to God and see if you can let go of it. <laughs> If you can't let go, you've got your answer, don't you? There's something you love more than God. Something that you just have to do. And here's the best part of that. You usually have it pretty thoroughly justified that nobody understands or they're not doing it my way. So therefore, right? That's the rational explanation I've always seen with an agenda. Nobody understands me. It's not different. I'm different. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. But that third element is just plain feelings. Carnal emotions with physical physiology. You know there's a difference between an emotion down here. This is the seat of the emotions. And feelings can permeate your whole body. Someone says they don't have feelings. We step on their foot and say, did you feel that? All right. <laughs> no, that's a physiological feeling. And there is a distinctive difference. <clears throat> You've got to learn the difference because the enemy can use that external. Does God want your will? Where does he work from? The inside. Does the devil want your will? Where does he work from? The outside. So he can just beat Christians up left and right with feelings. You could have a great victory and then all of a sudden he just bombards you with feeling bad. He can even give you a hyper feeling that's an adrenaline rush, but you think it's just God being good to me. If you're that feeling oriented, you are a candidate for deception. And you will say there's a lot of things that are God that are not God. If it's God, you have no so in your knower, not by your external feelings. Do you see how easy this? Would this save some new believers a lot of trouble if they would learn this right up front? I think it would save some old timers too, really. Because if you got in the habit of living by your feelings, you have actually can become a bipolar Christian. The highs and the lows. And did you ever notice that some of the best highs are followed by some of the worst lows? But all of this, there's a reason for this, for you to learn Jesus in it. And we will give you the answer in part two. <laughs> but right now, we're going to conclude with praying that I do never want to enjoy a spiritual feeling more than I love Jesus. Can we just do that today? Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, if I never felt a effervescent joy of the Lord again, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.